Um, good afternoon and good morning for some of us here in the Americas. Um, my name is Emma Frati and welcome to Ethical Ecology and Synthetic Stigma Behind and Beyond Plant-Based Psychedelic Exceptionalism. Today we are assessing the medical, political, and social risks that plant-based psychedelic exceptionalism inflicts on the short and long-term goal of ending the war on people who use drugs. We are just beginning to learn so many things like our inner healing intelligence and mapping the brain at a synaptic level with psychedelics. However, the knowledge that could surface is stunted by political, social, and legal hurdles we now seek to overcome. After 50 years of the war on drugs, today we seek to dismantle and restructure the discriminatory drug policies by centering drug users and marginalized people of color. The war on drugs was structural racism institutionalized to legally harm non-white entities. But this violence has been standard in colonization for over 500 years. I say this because a 15 minute presentation is a microcosm of generations of violence and harm. And the drug war is one of many iterations of oppression that people of color carry with them today. I admit that the scope is limited to the human rights of drug users. And while conservation around drug production and trafficking is important, I could not begin to scratch the surface on this issue with the time I have allotted. So today we are talking about drug users and undertake the challenge of evaluating the harm reduction value of plant-based psychedelic exceptionalism movements. What I would like to emphasize before I move on is that decriminalization and descheduling is not a matter of if or when, it is about how. I'm sure most of us here are familiar with the ideology behind psychedelic exceptionalism, that psychedelics can be a panacea in the medical and wellness community, but it takes on another meaning within the recreational community, where some members differ from self-identifying as a drug user if they exclusively use psychedelic drugs. And this stigma is the result of recreational psychedelic community bias in defining what makes a chemical consumer a drug user. While psychedelic exceptionalism is a result of privilege to explore pleasure, personal growth, and healing, it oftentimes is self-limiting without understanding that most non-psychedelic drug users are looking for that same experience. More exclusive psychedelic movements go as far as to separate synthetic psychedelics like research chemicals, LSD, or MDMA from their groups and aim to deschedule plant-based psychedelics and pervert drug scheduling and rescheduling away from evidence-based reform right back to subjective opinions. In this presentation, I refer to plant-based psychedelic exceptionalism as the foundation of movements exclusively focused on decriminalizing the growth, personal possession, and consumption of these plant-based psychedelic substances. And what does exceptionalism have to do with the war on drugs? Before we try to summarize 50 years of drug history, I wanna emphasize why this is an important question. We need to discuss this uncomfortable history in order to direct this presentation towards the future because these movements that exist in a vacuum are addressing only the symptoms of our history and vindicate the onus from the very systems from which our current issues of inequality stem from. We know from the prohibition era that banning alcohol does not prevent people from drinking. In fact, it directly increased the deaths associated with drinking. So it comes as no surprise that the war on drugs has led America to have the highest rate of low offense drug incarcerations and an adulterated supply leading to the highest drug related overdoses in the world. Because drug policies in the 70s had centered the elite and targeted marginalized communities of color, we know that America is constituted of institutions that have targeted people of color and used drug laws to structurally materialize racism and bigotry. Drug policies from the war on drugs era facilitated today's crisis and strict policies today only further perpetuate this crisis to low income communities of color. Have we learned anything in the last century? The bottom left newspaper was published in 1914 and the story read that cocaine gave a black man superhuman strength to withstand multiple bullets in the chest shot from a seven millimeter handgun. And though this was untrue, fear spread throughout the country and police officers were given more powerful handguns in response. And soon thereafter, taxation on cocaine made it financially exclusive to the white elite. A similarly unfortunate tale was told about young Michael Brown 100 years later in 2014, even after his toxicology report revealed he had no PCP in his system and all signs had led to racial injustice. 
our slow growth curve on educating ourselves on the misinformation around drugs and drug users is no longer an excuse for perpetuating this stigma. We have been injecting morality arguments into drug policy to disproportionately blame and marginalize black and brown users for 100 years too long. And we have an overdose crisis today to show for it. It is time to prioritize restorative justice and change public perception of drugs and drug users. So in honor of today's symposium theme, I propose that we consider the ways in which policy regarding psychedelics may be regenerative structures to our at-risk community. Because policy shouldn't be about drugs anymore, it should be about how it affects the people. If we do not observe the centering efforts in plant-based psychedelic decriminalization, we must see if these movements actually perpetuate harm rather than put a stop to it. Right now, there is not enough evidence to suggest that plant-based psychedelics possess more medical potential or less abuse potential than their synthetic counterparts. So who is this movement centering and could it be deeply rooted in our community's misinformed perception of drugs and synthetic stigma? If these substances are rescheduled on the basis that they are not drugs, but rather plants, we are not grounding our reform in evidence or data, but opinions and discriminatory separation of chemicals. Again, let's consider the fact that decriminalization is happening as we speak, so it's not a matter of if or when. We must focus on how we decriminalize psychedelics, meaning that the policies that deschedule psychedelics can set the groundwork for future harm reduction policy. And the more inclusive the foundation, the greater social, medical, and legal impact it can have. And if we want to make strategic long-term impact resolutions for the war on drugs and for psychedelic research, we need to change our approach from bias around drugs to research and policy that prioritizes the user. The long-term effect of decriminalizing plant-based psychedelics by the virtue of their ecological occurrence is the promise of commoditization we cannot sustainably produce for the future. We will return soon to the economic regression of supply in a model that exceptionalizes plant-based psychedelics while re-stigmatizing ecologically sustainable synthetic counterparts but to put it simply, decriminalizing possession will initially increase incentive for people to do illegal things like traffic protected plants like peyote from protected ground. And to answer who this impacts the most by this implicit stance, let's look to the First Nations indigenous community. The Native American church and the indigenous people, the in indigenous peyote conservation initiative have spoken out about the risks conservation efforts face if psychedelic descheduling includes these legacy plants. They have explicitly requested peyote be absent from any non-indigenous decriminalization efforts. It is important to protect, protect this sacred part of indigenous culture and not perpetuate the very tyranny of colonization that forced migrations and caused the endangered status of the peyote plant today. And because plant-based psychedelic exceptional exceptionalism movements do not include the synthetic equivalent, their very foundation of the movement's mission is entangled on many domains of marginalization and exclusivity. So if it is not a matter of if or when, we must ask, can plant-based psychedelics be descheduled without perpetuating these cycles of harm? The impact plant-based psychedelic exceptionalism takes on decriminalization and rescheduling is various but we're exploring how movements that intentionally separate plant-based psychedelics from, their syn from other synthetic psychedelics limit unbiased evidence-based research and pose additional harm to people who use drugs. And this major consequence of plant-based psychedelic exceptionalism can be explained in many ways, but I'm gonna use economics because everyone loves graphs. Drug demand is inelastic. So when users can no longer afford the price of their drug, they will move to a more affordable, less reliable supply which is the primary way prohibition is linked to our overdose crisis impacting specific lower socioeconomic groups. Now, if we apply the same logic to plant-based psychedelics and their synthetic equivalent, we will see plant-based psychedelic prices increase and lead to a new demand in the, affor the affordable illicit synthetic equivalent. This will limit the availability to those who can afford it. And we have 30 years of data from the war on drugs about how adulteration in an unregulated market is more associated with death than drug use itself. Not only does plant-based psychedelic exceptionalism indirectly incentivize the adulteration of the synthetic market supply, but the long-term effect of this price change and demand inelasticity also leads to increased stigma associated with synthetic drug users in general, which will decrease users' perceived equity for harm reduction services. But plant-based psychedelic exceptionalism has never really claimed to be harm reduction focused movement. 
Their foundation centers the plant-based user who benefits from this descheduling and pervert the definition of accessibility to fit the, defi the, to fit the definition of plant-based psychedelic exceptionalism's ideologies. Here we go. And if accessibility and equity, and if the accessibility and equity gap in the current psych psychiatric field is what psychedelic therapy could answer to, plant exceptionalism diverges from that mission. A major consequence of synthetic stigma perpetuated by plant-based exceptionalism is the superimposed barriers to synthetic research and research with drugs at large. The video link below here expands on the risk researchers must incur to institution institutionally in order to facilitate trials with plant-based and synthetic schedule one drugs. For example, MDMA, which is revealed to be highly efficacious in treating PTSD remaining schedule one, while other schedule one plant-based psychedelics get descheduled, will increase the barriers to institutional research and clinical trials that investigate MDMA's therapeutic potential. Long-term consequences of bias and descheduling will also impact the amount of research done on all synthetic substances. Because in order to gain the notoriety in the rapidly developing psychedelic field, researchers will follow on this perversion of accessibility to gain easier access to descheduled plant-based psychedelics. Because gaining access to Schedule One substances is tedious and a waste of time, which in turn will make our understanding of the synthetic Schedule One drugs limited and muted by the biased medical model. So how can plant-based psychedelic exceptionalism be an effective policy reform model if it does not challenge the overarching issues behind our current status of drug, drug scheduling? Are we willing to risk adulteration and preventable overdoses or even effective treatment research just because we want decriminalized plant-based psychedelics first? Efforts to destigmatize synthetic drugs and synthetic substitutes to plant-based psychedelics should be adjunct to decriminalization, not following. This will create an ecologically sustainable foundation that centers marginalized people without perpetuating further harm. I emphasize this because plant-based psychedelic exceptionalism movements curate a privilege over synthetic drugs and decriminalize Decriminalization efforts should not perpetuate the violence insinuated by the very bias and subjectivity we have together identified and now together seek to restructure. Natural or unnatural, we must consciously set a standard to reduce harm to the consumer. So it is up to you to answer if you believe plant-based psychedelic exceptionalism movements truly reduce harm. I hopefully, hopefully this will be the beginning of an important internal debate around the undertaking and responsibility of protecting those who use drugs while we evaluate the medical potential of chemicals free from institution, institutional and personal bias about plants and plants being drugs for that matter. Such a position would be a strong start to a regenerative future in the psychedelic field. Drug use is often not dangerous, yet by failing to remove our personal bias and social stigma, our current systems and policies fail to support people who use drugs, and we now face the largest overdose crisis in recorded history. Fortunately, bills listed here aim to respond to this crisis by centering restorative action and justice, like decriminalizing personal possession of all drugs. I hope you can take away from this presentation the nuanced roles that harm reduction policies and psychedelic research will play in a future of mutually regenerative support and people first prioritization. Whatever path we take to decriminalize psychedelics, we must uphold the golden standard not to incite harm to the greater community along the way. Clearly, we can't answer how psychedelics should be decriminalized in, 15, in a 15 minute presentation. And while this presentation may have generated more questions than answers, my goal was to raise concern to the toll plant exceptionalism movements could cost to class disparity and social inequality. It has been an absolute pleasure introducing an alternative perspective on what regenerative policy might look like and how reducing harm associated with drug use is fundamental to a regenerative future. Thank you.